our next panel, Gender Orders and Changing Gender Roles. We will have the chance to continue uh, aspects of uh, women and law. Two of the papers will focus on current developments regarding uh, the order of law and uh, also uh, we will have the chance to, to get some new data from Muslim women activism and with this panel uh, we have a comparison between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Two of our speakers are from South, uh, Southeast Asian experts and one is a South Asian expert. I would just briefly introduce the speakers to you. Uh, the first is Silvia Batuk on my right. Here she is Professor Emerita at the University of Illinois at Chicago and uh, she did her PhD in 1970 at Harvard University and since then she is doing extensively field work in India on uh, Muslim women, uh, particularly in the field of law and also on um, a topic we already uh, referred to, namely Muslim women activism or Islamic feminism and uh, she published uh, an article on Islamic feminism, wh which is an approach which might be come up uh, with s within several panels of this conference, because it, it is an important uh, approach, a very contested uh, uh, approach, which is debated within and uh, without uh, um, the Muslim communities. Yeah. Um, the second speaker is Michael Pellets. Michael Pellets is professor of anthropology at Emory University. He got his MA and PhD from the University of Michigan. And uh, as a student, he was with the University of Chicago. Is that right? You got your, P your BA from University of Chicago? Oh, California, not Chicago. Okay. Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael's research interests include uh, gender and sexual diversity, law, discipline and disorder, social and cultural theory, cultural politics of religion and modernity, and uh, he did field work in Malaysia since ages, I think. <laughs> so he is one of the great experts of uh, Malaysian anthropology and he worked on very different fields starting from kinship organizations and is now in the field of, uh, of law. One of his books, um, Islamic Modern Religious Courts and Cultural Politics in Malaysia dealt uh, with, uh, the, um, with the topic of in how far Islamic courts uh, have a benefit for women or not. And uh, his, his last book is Gender Pluralism, Southeast Asia Since Early Modern Times. So that is uh, another prominent theme in his research to focus on the diversity of gender constructions within uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, and uh, finally I want to introduce uh, Rachel Rinaldo to you. She is assistant professor at the University of Virginia and uh, now has also a guest professorship at Mich Michigan University and, Ch and Rachel graduated um, from uh, the un University of Chicago uh, with a dissertation on mobilization, mobilizing piety, women, Islam and the public sphere in Indonesia and uh, she is an anthropo- no, she is a social she, she's a cultural so sociologist, but uh, in fact, I, I always identify you as an anthropologist because your methods and your approach is, is uh, very, very clear to, to uh, anthropology, or basically is anthropology, so you work on the borderline between two disciplines and uh, probably you, uh, you, you are enriching sociology and uh, helping sociologists to overcome the boundaries of uh, ethnocentric theory. Um, Rachel uh, did research on uh, religious women uh, movements in Indonesia 
and uh, she will tell us with a paper uh, how they conceptualize themselves and uh, how they uh, engage in in the public sphere and uh, things like that. So I I will stop here since we have three speakers and uh, we'll give them uh, the time to explore uh, on their uh, topics. Yes, the first is Sylvia, please, the floor is yours. Um, well, one of the central themes in contemporary um, Indian Muslim women's activism um, is the idea that the um, Quran gives women many legal rights that have been denied them in practice in within the context of Indian society and the Indian <coughs> clerical establishment uh, has not been sympathetic to many of the rights that really they should get uh, in Islam. Um, and the reasoning they, uh, the reasons for this, they say, are at least twofold. One is because of the patriarchal, misogynist clerical establishment, which interprets the sacred text in ways that tend to favor male interests. And secondly, because Muslims, having lived in India for generations, and the majority of Muslims are actually Con, uh, or their ancestors were co converts from Hinduism, they've continued to follow many of the indigenous customs, um, and these have you know, crept into uh, Muslim uh, practices. Um, now, one area in which there is <coughs> demonstrably a great divergence between the letter of Islamic law, whatever we exactly mean by that, uh, and the actual practice in India is that are, uh, that concerns women's property rights. But somewhat ironically, this is not an issue that the uh, uh, Muslim feminist activists in India have placed much emphasis on in their campaigns for greater equity under Muslim personal law. Um, I defer to Nida and <laughs> Rafi uh, on this, and there may be more, you know, developments in that area more recently. But uh, as far as I'm aware, this is not has not been one of their major focuses, and particularly they have not focused on the issue of inheritance by women uh, from their natal homes. That is, the law that allows uh, a woman, a daughter to inherit property from her father or from her mother. Or, so this aspect of in, uh, Islamic inheritance law is not very much uh, practiced uh, in India. Um, now, ooh, what happened to page two here? <laughs> oh, here it is. It's on the back. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so. The two main areas of Islamic law that specifically provide access um, to property is by inheritance as a daughter, as a sister, as a mother, as a wife. There are certain specific shares uh, that you're entitled to. And the other is uh, the mehr, the wedding gift from the husband at the time of marriage. But I'm only going to discuss the question here for limits of time the question of inheritance uh, as a daughter uh, from, the par from the father mainly, or from the parents, um, because this is the, the larger um, issue within the question of inheritance for, for Indian women. The rules, of course, and most of you are probably familiar, I'm not going to go into all the rules of inheritance, but basically uh, daughters have a, have a specific share that, that to which they're entitled uh, when their father dies. Um, the size of that share is always half of what uh, their brother would get. Uh, and so, uh, of course, depending how many brothers they have, how many sisters they have, and so on. But anyway, they get a certain percentage, but it is always uh, half as large as what a, um, the man uh, in the same relationship would get. Um, female inheritance rights are further secured 
by the provision governing wills. Uh, only one third of an estate may be distributed by will, and the beneficiary of, the beneficiary of a will may not be a person who is otherwise entitled to inherit a share um, from the person who died. So a man cannot in disinherit his daughter or his wife by writing a will in favor of the son or some other person. Now, using wills to disinherit daughters is a routine practice among Indian Hindus for whom there is no limit on the use of wills. Um, also, under Hindu law, so sons and daughters inherit equally. So this provides a particular motivation to uh, Hindu men if they're inclined to give preference to sons that they can write a will um, rather than allow their property to go by intestate succession. And this is especially done with agricultural land. Now, this option is not very much available uh, to a Muslim. Um, a Muslim can also get around the provisions of Islamic inheritance law for you know, giving inheritance to daughters by giving a pre-mortem gift. Um, and he can give that to one of his future heirs um, or to someone else. So as far as women's property rights are concerned, this can work in one of two ways. It can work to a woman's advantage because it can be used to ensure that a daughter is well provided for after one's death, you know, just in case uh, uh, the, the inheritance law is not upheld by, the, by one, the sons. But on the other hand, it can also be used to give the son a larger share of one's assets, and then that would make the woman, the daughters, what the daughter would get much smaller. So this, this can work both ways. Another way of getting around uh, the uh, Islamic inheritance uh, law, uh, which is being increasingly used, especially by uh, you know, educated upper class uh, Muslims, is to, well, one has married under Muslim law, but then one can register one's marriage under another law called the Special Marriage Act, which is basically a secular civil marriage law. So you can re-register your marriage under that act, and when you do that, th the inheritance um, f follows that law rather than following Muslim law. So people want to favor one child over another, want to see that the child of a predeceased son will get a share of the estate, which would not be the case if it's, uh, uh, if it's under Muslim inheritance law. Or if you have no children and you want your wife to inherit your whole estate or the majority of it, rather than letting it go to your brothers or your brother's children, then this is a very useful ploy um, and is increasingly being used for those in the know and those who can you know, consult a lawyer and so on. Um, So, for example, one of the uh, people that I uh, uh, interviewed in my recent research on the subject told me about a couple that she knows that has two daughters and no son. Their nephews have been, she said, she called it, they have been getting vibes from the nephews that they believe that they have a claim on the inheritance. Um, because the couple has no son. I mean, they do have a claim if the couple has no son. They haven't actually said anything about it, but this couple wants to um, ensure that they can leave all of their property to their daughters. And so they have done what my friend Zarina called a very clever thing and registered their marriage under the um, Special Marriage Act. Most Muslim families, uh, even don't do any of these ways of getting around it, but they simply do not follow the letter of the Muslim law when settling a state. Division of property in most cases is done very informally, if at all, which I will say. Frequently, the property is not divided for at least two or three generations. 
The daughters have married out in most cases. They're living with another family. The sons remain with the parents or nearby, often occupying the house and or the land. And it doesn't even occur to daughters after the, after the parents die to stake a claim to, their, uh, to the share that they're entitled. This is generally true among Hindus also, and I won't uh, go through it, but there's a very good book by Srimati Basu that discusses this very issue, that people's attitudes and practice with regard to uh, women's inheritance from their natal uh, kin. Uh, and she finds, as I found also with Muslims, that it's very rare and the attitude toward it is very negative. I mean, the attitude toward a woman who will claim her share is, is very disapproving. Um, there's a marked disjunction, of course, between the Islamic inheritance law and Indian cultural traditions. Males are in India generally, and among Muslims also, are thought to be the appropriate and rightful owners of land and other immovable property. And the um, females are viewed as appropriately dependents. They're entitled to be maintained and taken care of by their natal family before marriage, and then are handed over to their husband's family who then takes over the responsibility, and then their sons will take over. But they're not thought of as, um, uh, you know, people who should be controlling property directly by themselves. They can use it, they could talk about it as theirs, but it isn't written in their name and they don't really have control over it. Um, this, pri this research that I was doing is part of a much larger international project that is looking at pro uh, property and its transfer in Muslim majority or Muslim majority countries or, or countries like India that have a very large Muslim population, although, of course, in India it's a minority. Um, the India team, of which there are three of us, we have decided to focus on the issue of women's property and inheritance. Um, and so uh, I did exploratory interviews last November uh, with about 40 Muslim, uh, most of them women, in order to identify some of the major issues, recurring patterns, and culturally shared notions about and constructions of women's proper relationship to property. Um, so I'm just going to talk about that part which, which pertains to women's um, interests in natal family property. Uh, wait a minute. Seven, <laughs> eight, okay. Um, okay, almost all of the people I interviewed agreed that it is very rare for a woman to get any share of her natal property when her father and or mother died. And most felt it was both inappropriate and unwise for a woman even to raise the issue of taking a share, and that if the worst thing she could do was to take the initiative to demand, as they, they make a demand, mangna, or even worse, to seize kabza karna, her share, against the, uh, int against the wishes of the male heirs. Now, if a man of his own accord chooses to apportion a share of the pa parents' inheritance to their sisters, they're admired for their generosity, for their open-heartedness, and for their fidelity to the dictates of Islam. But if a woman asks for her share, or even indicates that she thinks she ought to have it, she's viewed with great disdain, characterized as greedy, selfish, and lacking in family feeling. Um, all of the interviewees agreed that such a woman would not only alienate her brothers and other members of her immediate family and irreparably damage her relationship with them, but would suffer strong social disapproval. And they shared this negative perception. They weren't only saying other people would think so, but they thought so themselves. Um, if a woman's brother generously offers her a share, 
One woman suggested that the best thing to do would be, well, there were two things. You could either outrightly refuse to take it, or a better thing would be to accept it and then to insist that your brother take it back. That way, both the brother and the sister would be commended by the society. The former for having, I mean, that is the brother for having adhered to Sharia law and shown love and consideration for his sister, and the latter for placing family relationships above crass material interests. Um, so one of my uh, interviewees, Shah Jahan, who's a 45-year-old teacher, um, said, women should take their share from their father's side, but usually they don't, because they don't want to spoil their relationship with their natal family. A smart way to do it is to take the share and then give it back to the brothers. Um, this will make the brothers indebted to her. If you don't even take it, but just let it remain with them, then it remains unnoticed that, you'd given, that you have given them anything. For many interviewees, in any way, the whole issue was a purely hypothetical one, because they claimed they'd never even heard of a woman laying claim to her share of property. Those who did know of women who had done so said that it had created a serious rift between them and their natal kin, their brothers, their brothers' wives, and their brothers' children. These women were no longer welcome in their natal home on either informal or festival occasions. Coming and going, anajana, between them had stopped, and as had all the customary forms of ritual gift exchange, lena dena, between the siblings. And later, when the women encountered some personal difficulties in their marriage or whatever, they were unable to rely on their brothers for assistance. So if you were considering taking a share of the inheritance, you really needed to carefully weigh the monetary value of the property you would get against the emotional value uh, and the practical value of the family relationships that would be broken if you insisted on your legal rights. Only the most selfish and unfeeling woman would choose the former option. However, we did, we did uh, collect quite a number of narratives of women who had received a share of their grandparents' or parents' estate. Marital status seems to be a significant variable. If a woman is single, either never married, divorced, or widowed, the likelihood is greater that she will claim or will be offered a share or, or be provided for in some other way because of the sense that she is more needy. She doesn't have a man to support her, and so the brothers will step in very often in those cases. Um, Talat, a, long, a young college student, uh, explained um, that one of her father's sisters did get a share of her father's father's property. There were four sons and four daughters. All the daughters were offered a share by their brother, but three of them refused to take it because they were all married and well-placed. But one was widowed and not well off, so, so the brothers insisted that she take her share. Even though, as Talat said, it's really not seen in a good light if a woman takes any of her paternal property. But in this case, there was some uh, justification for it. Another thing that happens sometimes is that a woman's husband or in-laws pressures her to make a claim against the natal estate when her father dies. Usually she resists doing so at first, but eventually complies uh, because she, of continual harassment over the issue. And the result then is usually that the brothers hand over the property, but then effectively sever all uh, social ties with her. One woman, only one woman admitted that she, to have taken, to have asked for a share of her natal property when a parent died, but she made it very clear that she had done so for one of her sis, for the sake of one of her sisters, not for her own. Um, this in this family there were five sisters and three brothers. M most of these families are very large. The father, now deceased, had a house in Old Delhi. We saw some pictures of that yesterday. Um, the father gave a generous dowry when, uh, 
when the youngest sister married, but her in-laws kept harassing her for more. So she and her husband moved out of the family home into a rented room. But he soon died, and she found it necessary to move back in to her natal home with her brothers. Her father was dead by that time. Um, so her older sister and two other sisters, all three of whom are married and economically doing well enough, um, decided to claim their shares of the father's estate with the intention of giving them to this younger sister. They wanted to be sure that the brothers or the brothers' wives would not force their youngest sister out of the, out of the house, something that often does happen, uh, and felt that the only way to do this was to have these shares, which would be um, a total of, full, of two full shares you know, between the four sisters, give it all to her, and, and that would uh, and get the room that she's occupying in the family home registered in her own name so that she could not, could not be dislodged from there. Um, another case, uh, a middle-aged widow, Nasima, living in a house jointly owned by her late husband and his brother, uh, had sisters-in-law who had laid claim to part of the parents' estate. Um, after the, f the, the father had bought a house for, for four sons, giving each one a floor, that's where she was living, he had also bought another house for the fifth son and two sisters who had never, or two daughters who had never married. After the father died, those three in that second house sold the house, kept the money, and the sisters moved back into the father's parents' house, which should have been divided among all seven siblings. But the sisters refused to vacate so that it could be sold and the profit distributed. So this has resulted in a huge fight within the family um, that has not been resolved and probably will not be as long as the sisters uh, don't, you know, are not persuaded to leave. Um, in several cases, fathers had made financial provisions before they died for a daughter who had no male protector. Probably men do this because they are not very sure that their sons are going to live up to their uh, wishes, you know, to take care of their sister after they die. So they will make a gift, put money into a savings account in the daughter's name, buy a flat for her, or legally transferring ownership of a portion of the family property into her name. So in this way, on, they don't have to uh, depend on the brothers to offer. Am I doing okay for time? No, I think five minutes. Five minutes? Oh, fine. Great. Um, <laughs> very often, however, as I think I, I alluded to this at the beginning, very often, or perhaps in the majority of cases of the people we interviewed at least, property is not distributed, is not divided on the death of a person. Um, instead, it is kept intact in joint ownership for at least two generations, sometimes three or more generations, and is only subdivided when someone in a th third or fourth generation, which these would be, uh, you know, grandchildren or, or, or actually um, nephews or cousins of the, you know, the current generation, who now that, now that the ownership has been spread out over so many people, usually the more distant uh, relatives demand uh, that it be divided and uh, for force the others or persuade the others to divide uh, the property. This is especially true if the property is in the form of agricultural land, the owners are living outside of their village place of origin, and the land is being cultivated by tenants or agricultural laborers, sometimes supervised by one among the set of brothers or cousins who, have, who still live in the family's ancestral home. So then what they do is that the produce or the profits from sale of the produce of the land 
is then distributed among all of the co-owners, and often, although not always, among the women as well, in the proportions that Islamic law prescribes. So uh, another case of uh, a woman named Ashu, a middle-aged housewife married to a government service servant. Um, she has one daughter and one son and has property that was inherited not through her father but through her mother. Her mother and father had lived together only briefly after marriage. Her mother returned to her natal home, the father visiting from time to time. So they had, you know, the two children. Um, but the mother died shortly after giving birth to Ashu, and she and her brother were brought up by her maternal grandparents. When, when they died, one of her male cousins, that is her mother's brother's son, tried to claim the entire estate on the grounds that the children of a deceased daughter have no claim on the inheritance. But the great-grandmother, the mother's father's mother, who is still alive, insisted that they be given their dead mother's share. Now, obviously, this was an informal arrangement, but the division was, was uh, registered. That land still remains undivided and is taken care of by hired managers. So every year, the Ashu uh, and her brother get uh, some produce from, from the land. The question of disputes over inheritance uh, was another aspect of the research. What happens when, huh? I'm coming to, okay, I'll come to that. All right, why don't I forget about the, that? I'll come, just one, the question I raised in the beginning, how is it that Muslim women activists are not really highlighting this issue when they're looking at so many other things uh, in terms of uh, women's Islamic rights. This doesn't seem to be a high priority issue. Um, and it seems to me that to some extent, uh, these activists do accept the idea, the culturally accepted idea, that a woman's place is in her husband's home and that it's his responsibility and that of her in-laws to take care of her economic needs, and that actually the idea that what belongs to the husband also belongs to his wife. So when she marries into the family, that is the property that is hers, although it isn't hers, you know, individually hers. Um, so they don't really feel in their heart of hearts that natal property belongs to them. I, as women don't really feel that, na that they that they really any longer have a claim to natal property, just as their brothers don't feel that they have it. Um, if they get it from a generous father or brother, that is very nice, but they don't really believe that it belongs to them by right. So women, Muslim women's rights activists, similarly, are much more likely to ask that the male clergy enforce the payment of meher, which comes from the husband's side, um, preferably at the time of marriage, and, and some of them are demanding this, you know, that, that there would be some way to make sure that the mayor is actually paid. Um, and they've also demanded, in some cases, that a battered woman's rights in the marital home be recognized and preserved. But so far, they've really steered clear of demanding that the Islamic law of inheritance for daughters be adhered to. And uh, so this is an issue, I think, for me, it's something that I want to look into more. Thank Th you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for the excellent talk, which shows the, uh, uh, the differences between norm and practice, which sh seems to be one of the uh, most interesting topics to do research on. Yeah, the next speaker is, is Michael Pilitz. Michael, please just start. No, okay. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers and the sponsors for kindly you know, inviting me to the conference. I, I appreciate it very much. In August 2011, I returned to the Islamic court in the district of Rembau, Negri Sembilan, Malaysia. This was the site of extensive ethnographic and archival research I undertook during the period 1987 to 1988. The changes in the court's appearance, discourses, and practices in the intervening 23 years 
were quite striking, as were certain continuities. For starters, the courthouse was altogether new, more lavish, and more spacious. In some ways, moreover, it was exceedingly high-tech, the noisy old typewriters having been replaced by a bevy of top-notch PCs that provided instant, instant access to nationwide databases and the World Wide Web. <clears throat> the judge I had come to know in the late 1980s, who was born in Negris of Milan and was thus an insider, had passed away, as had many members of his staff. His replacement was born in the state of Tranganu and was thus an outsider by local criteria and was far more businesslike in his appearance, appearance and his approach to the law. Unlike his predecessor, for instance, he did not wear, quote, traditional Malay attire, baju malayu, baggy pants, sandals, and a sonko or skull, skull cap. Rather, he donned the exceedingly corporate garb worn by white collar employees in many sectors of the Malaysian civil service and by corporate executives worldwide. A smartly tailored black business suit, white button down shirt, fashionable necktie, conservative black shoes, etc. More generally, in contrast to the late 1980s, all hearings are nowadays held in the large cavernous courtroom rather than in the judge's private chamber. And the walls of the courthouse are adorned with plaques outlining the vision, mission, and objective of the courts, a client's charter promising friendly, fair, timely, and satisfactory service, and, and banners celebrating the commitment of the court to protocols of the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO. The signboard to the right of the entrance to the courthouse contains a list of 12 different rules pertaining to the proper comportment of those visiting the courts. This was a significant departure from the single admonition posted there during the late 1980s, which advised women to cover their heads. The new, greatly expanded list includes rules admonishing visitors to respect the judge and the court, to refrain from protesting the court's decisions, and to always control one's emotions. This greatly expanded list of do's and don'ts is emblematic of the more regulated relationship to authority and to the management of the self that political and religious elites have sought to normalize in the years since my earlier fieldwork. Another sign of the times were the gifts the judge instructed his staff to provide me as I was leaving. Glossy brochures highlighting the work of the courts, along with a notepad, a ballpoint pen, a traveling coffee mug, and a colorful, sturdy tote bag, all variably emblazoned with the corporate logos, slogans, and patented trademarks of the Islamic judiciary. Based on anthropological research spanning the period 1987 to 2011, this paper describes and analyzes continuities and transformations in Malaysia's Islamic judiciary during the past few decades and the new millennium in particular. The longer version of this paper is organized into two main sections. The first focuses on historical continuity since the late 1980s with particular references to dynamics of gender and what I refer to later on as lawfare. The second concerns transformations that have occurred since the late 20th century. These include seemingly contradictory changes entailing both Islamization and the modeling of the Islamic judiciary on its more powerful and prestigious civil law counterpart, processes of bureaucratization and corporatization, and the expansion of the Sharia judiciary with respect to criminal offenses. In the interest of time, I have to skip much of the second section of the paper, though I will say a few things about what I refer to as creeping, <coughs> excuse me, creeping criminalization. I begin with continuities with respect to gender. Um, this is making sort of strange noises often. Should I do something to, maybe I could do without it? Can people hear me in the back? Uh, okay, maybe it, it's okay? Yeah, Away from my mouth. Away yeah, from, <laughs> from breathing. Okay, I, I, I'll try not to breathe. Okay. Um, <coughs> <laughs> breathe, but not into the microphone. <coughs> breathe, it but not into the microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try. It sounds like going to the doctor's office. Okay. As in times past, the vast majority of plaintiffs in Islamic courts, both in the district of Rembau and in Malaysia as a whole, are women, just as most defendants are men typically plaintiffs' husbands or former husbands. Noteworthy as well are continuities in the types of cases that women, and to a lesser extent men, 
bring to the courts, the vast majority of which concern civil rather than criminal matters. As in previous decades, female plaintiffs typically petition the courts to help them resolve problems associated with their husband's failure to provide spousal or child maintenance and or to clarify the status of their marriages or to seek either a tatlik divorce due to a violation of a stipulation in the marriage contract or a termination of marriage via FASA, which is very, variably translated as judicial voiding of the marriage contract or annulment. The latter is a bit simplistic, but it's okay. The first two sets of issues are inextricably linked insofar as women who have not received support from husbands who have left home to seek a li <coughs> living are commonly unclear as to whether or not their husbands have simply been delinquent in providing them with money or news of their whereabouts or have in fact divorced them via the Tala repudiation clause. The latter clause need not be recited in, the presence, in their presence or in the court to effect a valid divorce, though failure to do so in the courthouse is illegal. There is a distinction, as many of you know, between validity and legality. Women seeking takli or fasat divorce are often in the courts for the same general kinds of reasons. Men usually approach the courts to obtain formal approval of their divorces or to seek the court's permission for polygynous unions, but not for clarification of ambiguity or because of financial hardship. In this, too, we see considerable continuity with times past, as well as important changes that require men to obtain the court's permission to effect a divorce or a polygynous marriage that is legitimate in the eyes of the state. Relevant here are quantitative data on court use obtained by anthropologists in the late 1980s and early uh, 1990s, and their congruence with material from the period 2005 to 2010. Data I collected in the course of my study of the Islamic Magistrate's Office in Rembau Negri Sambilan during the period 1987 to 88, for example, indicated that women were plaintiffs in 67% of the cases. Statistics from Selangor and Kedah, two other states, states of Selangor and Kedah, obtained in 1990 and 1991 by other researchers indicate broadly comparable patterns. Women were the plaintiffs in 79% and 92% uh, <clears throat> of those cases, respectively. There are, of course, many data that these dynamics, <clears throat> sorry, there are, of course, many dynamics that these data do not speak to, but I'm primarily concerned with the fact that the vast majority of plaintiffs in all three of these states, Negri Sambilan, Selangor, and Kedah, were women. Aggregate data collected by the Department of Islamic Judiciary, which I'll refer to later as JKSM, Jabatan Kahaki Mancharia, Malaysia, bearing on the period 2005 to 2010, we feel, reveal profound continuity since the late 1980s. In Negri Sambilan, for example, women were plaintiffs in 73% of the cases brought to the courts. The corresponding figures for the other two states I mentioned, Selangor and Kedah, are 69% and 72% respectively. These statistics reveal that Malaysia's Islamic courts are still very much, quote, women's courts in the sense that women constitute the overwhelming majority of those who seek out the court services to help them resolve domestic and certain other problems. One set of reasons for this has to do with gender skewing in Islamic law, coupled with the way Islamic law is codified in Malaysia. In Malaysia, women lack legal prerogatives to resolve marital and related domestic problems without the help of the state-backed courts. Unlike men, in other words, women cannot divorce their spouses unless they have obtained the assistance and cooperation of the courts, hence the state. This is an exceedingly important historical continuity to bear in mind. So too is the fact that women continue to experience discrimination in the workplace and still bear the lion's share of responsibility for the socialization of and care of infants and children. One consequence is that, compared to men, women enter and experience marriage with, it, with significantly fewer economic resources to fall back on. They are thus not only much more dependent on their spouse's earnings than vice versa, but also far more likely than men to seek out the court's assistance when their spouse's financial contributions to the household are not forthcoming. Other gendered continuities include the fact that in various kinds of legal proceedings, women's bodies and bodily functions, for example, when they last menstruated, whether they're pregnant, and so forth, are the subject of much greater legal concerns than men. Consider also the gendered composition of court staff, especially judges. <clears throat> Prior to 2010, all of Malaysia's Islamic judges were men, 
a pattern in keeping with many other, but not all, Muslim-majority nations. In July 2010, however, the government announced, amidst much fanfare as might be expected, that two women had been appointed to serve as judges in the Islamic judiciary. In a speech announcing the decision, Prime Minister Najib declared that the appointments were made to enhance justice in cases involving families and women's rights, to meet current needs, and to help transform the Sharia judiciary. Najib went on to say that issues such as the fight for custody involving couples from different religions, this is a, a paraphrase actually, but the word fight was used, battles over the remains of deceased con converts, and disputes, again a quote, over property inheritance between Muslims and non-Muslims required a high level of expertise and wisdom to resolve. <clears throat> Language highlighting the latter kinds of hot-button interfaith cases and the symbolically laden fights, battles, and disputes associated with them is in many ways completely out of keeping with the day-to-day -day workload and tenor of Islamic courts. Statistically speaking, such cases are so rare that they barely appear in court ledgers detailing the relative frequency of the different kinds of cases that come before the courts, which are oriented toward negotiation, mediation, and compromise in any event, not zero-sum decisions that images of battles and such often conjure. But they are increasingly central, these terminologies, battles, disputes, etc., they are increasingly central to highly fraught public debates and wars of position bearing on the status and jurisdiction of Sharia in Malaysia and whether or not the government is doing too much, <clears throat> or not enough, to safeguard Islam. Media accounts the next day cited the Prime Minister's comments that the appointments were a historic moment for the country, showing that women were treated as men's equal, equals and that Islam does not set limitations for women to advance. In the following days, however, the media carried an announcement from Sharia court judge Muhammad Yusuf Chete that a panel had been set up to discuss the jurisdiction, read power and prestige, of the two women judges. Among the concerns were the kinds of cases they could not preside over. Muhammad Yusuf said the demarcation of duties was not gender discrimination, this is a quote, sorry, was quote, not gender discrimination, but based on Islamic rulings that could not be disputed, end of quote. But Muhammad Yusuf made no reference to the specific Islamic ruling in question, whether, for example, they might be found in the Quran or Hadith, in early medieval or subsequent Islamic history, or perhaps in recent Malaysian fatwa. Nor did he offer any clarification whatsoever concerning his statement that the Islamic rulings at issue, quote, could not be disputed, end of, end of quote. This bald but ex exceedingly ambiguous assertion was perhaps intended as a reference to passages and positions in the Quran and Hadith that might be subsumed under the category of mukam as distinct from mutashabi. Mukam is usually translated as inherently clear and intelligible beyond doubt and not susceptible to abrogation, hence allowing for only one clearly definitive interpretation and set of juristic opinions. At the same time, Muhammad Yusuf's assertion might have been intended and widely interpreted as a warning that the government would brook no debate on any of these matters and that anyone contesting the government's position would be liable for criminal charges <clears throat> under the state's Sharia enactments or the dread dreaded Internal Security Act, the ISA, which is a thoroughly secular provision that allows for indefinite detention without specific charges or the prospects of a trial. The state's manipulation of these kinds of ambiguities is a key component of strategies of governance involving what John and Jean Komaroff refer to as lawfare. Lawfare, according to the Komaroffs, is typically characterized by a regime's, quote, use of its own rules, of its duly enacted penal codes, its administrative law, its states of emergency, its charters, mandates, and warrants, its norms of engagement, etc., to impose a sense of order upon subordinates and enemies by means of violence rendered legible, legal, and legitimate by the regime's so sovereign word, end of quote. In Malaysia, tactics of lawfare are not confine, confined to those who are part of the state apparatus. They are commonly deployed by conservative Muslim sectors of civil society to silence groups, such as Sisters in Islam, that are perceived as threatening their values and interests, or those of the race, nation, or global Muslim communities. While these strategies build on important historical precedent and thus represent a significant continuity vis-a-vis -vis earlier times, they have become particularly intense 
in the last decade or so. The recent appointment of two women as, as Islamic judges is clearly noteworthy, as is the strong likelihood that more women will be asked to serve as Islamic judges in the next few years. The fact remains, however, that at present women comprise a mere 1.4% of the nation's Islamic judges. Corresponding figures for the civil judiciary are far less skewed, though certainly not equal. <clears throat> in the civil judiciary, women comprise around 15 to 20 percent of the nation's judges. The more gender equitable distribution of judgeships that we see in the civil judiciary is likely to be a factor contributing to the increase of female judges in the Islamic judiciary. This is especially so since the political, religious, and specifically legal elites in charge of modern, modernizing the Islamic judiciary are commonly inspired by civil court models and the sensibilities and dispositions associated with them. Put differently, and to underscore a point taken up elsewhere, the gold standard that informs much of the rationalization and reform of Malaysia's Islamic judiciary is the nation's civil judiciary, along with innovations in family courts, alternative dispute resolution, psychological social work style counseling, etc., that one sees in the US, in Europe, in Australia, Japan, and so forth. It is not inspired, for the most part, by Sharia-based developments in Muslim-majority nations such as Saudi Arabia, the Sudan, Pakistan, Egypt, etc. This despite the fact that Islamization construed as the heightened salience of Islamic symbols, idioms, discursive traditions, and attendant practices in specifically political arenas and in realms of personal piety and religiosity is a goal that Malaysia's political and religious elites share with their counterparts in most other Muslim-majority nations. The contrast, in other words, is between Islamization broadly defined in the political realms and in the realms of personal piety and religiosity on the one hand versus what's going on in the courts. <clears throat> the next section of the written version of this pa paper focuses, on mostly, focuses mostly on corporatization, which I'll define a bit later, and on the increased centrality of common law models and sensibilities in the Islamic judiciary, and on the ju judiciary's embrace of Japanese systems of management and auditing to improve its performance and to enhance discipline, surveillance, and control. In the interest of time, I have to skip most of that and want to proceed directly to, to what I refer to as creeping criminalization, but I'll be happy to try to clarify what I just said if, if people are interested later on. Most relevant in the context of what I refer to as creeping criminalization is that the past few decades have seen successful efforts by political and religious elites to augment the criminal jurisdiction and penal power of the judici Islamic judiciary to encompass nearly everything under the sun that might be seen as involving the religious or moral comportment of Muslims. A critical caveat here is that this is exclusive of, offense, uh, of, sorry, of offenses lying squarely within the jurisdiction of the civil courts, such as theft, murder, stock market fraud, jaywalking, sedition, etc., which are already, with the partial exception of jaywalking, heavily criminalized and far more severely punishable than in times past. Before delving into these matters, it is essential to distinguish between the kinds of criminal cases that the Sharia judiciary is currently compact, uh, sorry, empowered to deal with but does not engage on a regular basis on the one hand and those that it commonly adjudicates on the other. Both sets of cases are important to consider, but they should not be confused. One reason for this is that the greatly expanded scope of religious and other offenses subject to the jurisdiction of the Islamic courts has not had an appreciable impact on the everyday practices, litigant base, or overall tenor of the courts, which are among my main concerns. The enhanced purview is nonetheless exceedingly significant in terms of the cultural political atmosphere, including relations certainly between Muslims and non-Muslims, and the directions that assemblages of religion, law, and governance are moving. Let us first consider the kinds of cases the criminal courts, uh, sorry, the criminal cases the Islamic courts uh, typically deal with. And this is where there's a handout somewhere around that people hopefully have that uh, I'm going to make a passing reference to. According to the uh, Department of Islamic Judiciary, uh, around 90 to 95 percent, the vast majority of criminal cases that come before the nation's Islamic courts during the period 2005 to 2009 fall into one or another of 13 official categories. Um, <clears throat> in the handout that I provided, I present the relevant categories. 
followed by the number of cases and the percentage for each category in relation to the total number of the cases. I list them in descending order of frequency, so the most common is at the top and so forth. Illicit proximity, <coughs> kalwat, is by far the most, criminal, uh, the most common criminal offense handled by the Islamic judiciary as evidenced by the fact that there were over 27,000 new cases registered in Malaysia during the period 2005 to 2009, compared with somewhat on, only around 5,400 new cases of activities deemed inappropriate in, pub, uh, inappropriate in public places that were newly registered during the same period, the latter being the second most common type of criminal offense coming before the Islamic courts. Consider also that cases of kalwat, again, illicit proximity is the best way to describe or translate that in the Malaysian context, are more than seven times as common as those involving charges of fornication or adultery. This is partly because kalwat is much easier to prove and is in some ways more obvious than fornication or adultery, requiring only that there are two or more credible witnesses to the couple being alone in a secluded or confined locale, as opposed to witnesses who actually observed sexual relations of the, sex of the illicit sort at issue here or other relevant evidence, such as an out-of-wedlock pregnancy. The main point of the handout is simply to show you that <coughs> kalwat's at the top. Everything else is relatively infrequent relative to that. <coughs> Both types of offenses, kalwat, and what in other Muslim settings is called zina, but in Malaysia is called bidasatubu luaranika, coupling or coitus or something outside of marriage, involve heterosexual couples, as do crimes associated with activities that are inappropriate in public places. Same-sex couples believed to have engaged in sexual transgression are not charged with any of these offenses, and do not typically come before the Islamic courts in any event. Rather, if charged with a crime, they're hauled before the civil courts, possibly under th Section 377 of the National Penal Code, which provides for imprisonment up to 20 years and whipping for any acts, whether or not consensual, of, quote, carnal intercourse against the order of nature, end of quote, which happens to be a British law, actually. Uh, this despite the fact that Islamic courses are authorized to deal with cases of liwat, which is usually translated as sodomy. More generally, and to oversimplify somewhat, the three types of Sharia criminal offenses that I have focused on here represent some 70% of the criminal cases heard by the Islamic judiciary during the period 2005 to 2009. Taken collectively, cases involving either divorce or polygamy without the permission of the courts or gambling comprise another 19% uh, of the court's workload during that same period. This is to say that some 90% of the court's criminal case load center on these six offenses. Three of the six infractions, illicit proximity, fornication, adultery, and gambling, have long been designated as Sharia crimes. Items on the top six list that have come to be defined as criminal behaviors since my field work in the late 80s include activities that are inappropriate in public places and divorce without the permission of the courts, the first of which is obviously exceedingly vague and for this reason alone of great concern to those who are wary of state-sponsored moral policing. In some, in some venues, I might add parenthetically, the criminalization of polygamy without the permission of the court predates my 87 to 88 field work. In other venues in Malaysia, it was criminalized a few years thereafter. Items on the more expansive list of 13 criminal offenses that are new include collusion and a male beho behaving or posing as a female, both of which are also quite vague and for that reason alone quite problematic. <clears throat> there are currently no laws on the books that define females behaving or posing as males as a Sharia offense. This may not be true for long, however, given the current cultural political climate and the telling fact that 2008 saw the National Fatwa Council issuing a condemnation of tomboys, which referred to basically females dressing or behaving like males, again, rather under-specific. Sexual relations between female persons is already listed as a Sharia crime in some venues in Malaysia and others not, having been designated as such since moral panics of the mid to late 1990s. Like Liwat, it is currently punishable in the Sharia courts by a fine of up to 5,000 ringgit, uh, 13, 1,400, uh, what, 5,000 divided by three is what, 1,600, sorry, US dollars, for example, imprisonment up to three years, or whipping with up to six strokes of the rotan. Uh, it's very important to note, however, that according to uh, what I know and according to scholars who I've talked to have studied these issues quite extensively, no women 
have been charged under these provisions in Malaysia's Islamic courts thus far. <clears throat> it doesn't mean they're not harassed, it just means they don't make it to the Islamic courts, those particular cases. We are now addressing Sharia crimes that are rarely, if ever, adjudicated by the Islamic judiciary, but are nonetheless of great symbolic and political import. It is thus uh, bears repeating that we need to distinguish between the types of cases that commonly become before the courts on the one hand, and those that the courts are empowered to deal with but do not usually address on the other. An additional two point, uh, two-fold point to reiterate is that the past few decades have seen vastly expanded definitions of what kinds of behavior constitute Sharia criminality. Um, okay, thank you. And that this bodes ill for Malaysia's Muslim and non-Muslim population insofar as the nation's top-heavy executive branch increasingly utilizes whatever resources it has available to stifle dissent and otherwise neutralize its real and imagined adversaries. And I should emphasize for those of you who may not know that roughly 40% of Malaysia's population is non-Muslim. The greatly augmented jurisdictions and penal powers of the Islamic courts now cover nearly 100 different types of criminal offenses. This matter is sure to grow in the years ahead. The sanctions the courts are empowered to impose for such crimes will, in all likelihood, be in uh, <clears throat> be increased in severity as well, as has been the trend in recent decades. Some of these crimes are relatively unambiguous and are not new, such as failure to perform Friday prayers and disrespecting Ramadan. Others, many of which are of recent provenance, are highly ambiguous, or at least p potentially so, particularly since the state monopolizes definitions of what constitutes appropriate Islamic behavior, but rarely, if ever, makes this explicit. Among the many things that are currently criminalized include wrongful worship, teaching false doctrine, making false religious claims, insulting or bringing into contempt the religion of Islam, deriding Quran verses or hadith, printing, publishing, producing, or disseminating material contrary to Islamic law, instigating neglect of religious duty, expressing contempt or defiance of religious authority, expressing an opinion contrary to fatwa, instigating a husband or wife to neglect spousal duties or to divorce, indecent acts in a public place, gender transgressive behavior on the part of males, same-sex relations involving either males or females, collusion, etc., as we have seen. This list is far from exhaustive. It would have to list about 99 provisions to be so, but it should suffice to convey a sense of how Malaysia's political and religious elites have endeavored to position the Islamic judiciary to better discipline and control Muslims and others in Malaysia and ostensibly help guide them to a more secure and prosperous future. I turn finally to my conclusion. <clears throat> in this paper, I've examined selected continuities and transformations in Malaysia's Islamic judiciary since the late uh, 1980s. Continuities in gender, power, and prestige are quite striking, as we have seen. So too are transformations in the discourses and practices of the court. Bureaucratization, rationalization, and corporatization are, in my view, the most relevant glosses for these latter dynamics, particularly if we focus on the routine, the ordinary, the quotidian operations of the courts, the types of cases that usually come before them, the kinds of cultural logics typically at play when they dispose of cases, and the general directions, emphasis here on the plural, that the judiciary as a whole is moving. The trope of Islamization is, of course, highly salient as well. It is nonetheless essential to bear in mind that it concerns to model the Islamic courts on the nation's far more powerful and eminently more prestigious system of civil courts and its common law practices have, in most contexts, been seen as more pressing than the needs to enhance the operation or legitimacy of the Sharia judiciary in specifically Islamic terms. A partial exception to this generalization is, perhaps, the expansion of the jurisdiction and penal power of the Islamic judiciary with respect to criminal matters, which, not coincidentally, is thoroughly entangled with creeping criminalization in private and public arenas subject to civil law, by which I mean common law. The two sets of historically specific dynamics, Islamization and the increased relevance of common law in the Sharia judiciary, should not be construed as mutually exclusive or inherently contradictory, though of course paradoxes and ironies abound. Throughout the past few decades, Malaysia's political, economic, and religious elites have been deeply but often ambivalently committed to a variant of neoliberal globalization. 
This has necessarily entailed embracing processes of corporatization and a host of others that I have not addressed here, such as privatization. As I've explained in more, <coughs> As I've explained elsewhere, my use of, of the term corporatization draws attention to the models, the practices, the sensibilities, and so on that prevail in upper level management circles in corporate capitalist business sectors in Malaysia and beyond. More generally, I'm interested in the relative permeation throughout Malaysian society of economistic and attendant administrative managerial values and interests once associated largely with the upper echelons of rational industrial capitalism that have become increasingly hegemonic across a wide variety of social, cultural, political, legal, and other domains. Indices of these trends include Japanese management and auditing regimes, which again I haven't talked about here, but I'll be happy to try to explain, ISO protocols, and the fetishization of key performance indicators, KPI, in the civil judiciary in universities and elsewhere, and also the spectacular growth of industries centered around Islamic management, banking and finance, and Sharia compliance in the workplace. Worthy of mention as well is the popularity of Indonesian organizations, excuse me, Indonesian origin organizations, such as ESQ, Emotional and Spiritual Quotient, which melds together Islamic doctrine and spirituality, Western management sciences, and pop psychology discourses of self-development. There are about 800,000 <coughs> 800, alumni of ESQ in Indonesia, which of course is quite, uh, quite a bit larger than Malaysia, and about 80,000 in Malaysia. In these latter initiatives, we see a clear commodification and rebranding of Islam as pro-corporate capitalist development, friendly to civil law sensibilities, okay, and otherwise modern, progressive, and this-worldly. No clash of civilizations here. This rebranding is strikingly evident in the Islamic judiciaries, which in authorities are endeavor endeavoring to market by means of densely networked sites in cyberspace, DV DVDs, media products, and ballpoint pens, tote bags, coffee mugs, etc., that are emblazoned with the logos. Uh, the, my last uh, comment literally is that as Malaysia further cements its, tie, its ties to the power knowledge networks of global capitalism, it increasingly resembles a gigantic emporium where everything is being merchandised. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for your inspiring lecture. And to our next speaker is Rachel. Okay, so this is a topic um, that I've been studying since uh, 2002, basically. Um, and the paper that, that I'm presenting today is, is very much a, a work in progress, um, where I'm looking at some of the issues that I've actually discussed in, in recent <coughs> articles, um, but reframing them to some degree um, to speak more about the issue of agency. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, with the global resurgence of pious religion in the last few decades, um, many scholars have been drawn to investigate the nature of agency among women in religious movements like Islam, Evangelical Christianity, Orthodox Judaism, and so on. And I think Indonesia, um, of course, is a, a particularly significant place to examine these dynamics, um, certainly because one of the most striking changes of the past um, 20 years or so has been the emergence of devout Muslim women who are politically active. Um, and these Indonesian Muslim women activists share a commitment to Islam, um, but are very much divided along political lines. And so what I'm going to do today is, is talk about women in two organizations which espouse rather different visions of the place of religion in the Indonesian nation state. Um, as well as different gender ideologies. And I argue that a key aspect of the agency of both groups of these activists uh, lies in interpretation of religious texts. And this interpretive agency, I, I think, has arisen from the confluence of democratization, the expansion of the middle class, and the Islamic revival. So because of uh, time limitations, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff, including this sort of normal lit review and, and methods, and sort of move straight into my comparisons of women in two organizations. Um, the first is um, called Fatayat Nalatul Ulama. It's the women's division of, of one of Indonesia's largest Muslim organizations. 
And then also women in a Muslim political party known as the Prosperous Justice Party, um, or which I'll refer to it as by its initials PKS. And I'll look a little at their understandings of, of various religious texts and how their activism is shaped by what I call their interpretive approaches. Um, and I'll look at this um, somewhat through the lens of the issue of polygamy, um, which has spurred a lot of recent activism in Indonesia. Um, and I chose these two organizations. There are actually four um, in my broader research, but I chose these two because I think at the, certainly at the leadership level, um, there are some very interesting similarities um, between the activists. Um, and certainly generationally, they're very much children of both the Islamic revival and democratization. And they're very much part of this recent generation of pious women, which is familiar with Islamic texts and interpretations, but also has access to middle class careers and educations. Um, so the women in both of these groups really share a commitment to practicing Islam in their daily lives, but the notion of what a more Islamic society is um, means something very different to them. So women learn um, what I call our different interpretive approaches to religious texts and practices through their participation in both of these organizations. Um, and what I mean by interpretation um, is quite broad. I'm, it doesn't necessarily just mean that they're actually personally reading the Quran, for example. Um, I'm trying to get at something broader with this idea. Um, basically, the processes in which women refer to understandings of religious texts in the course of their activism, or the ways that they justify their activism with reference to texts. Um, and I argue that the way they make use of texts um, is very much shaped by their particular interpretive approaches. Um, so those who adopt a contextual approach to texts are much more easily able to connect their religious beliefs with ideas about women's rights. Um, and they tend to be using Islam in a struggle for a more egalitarian nation. And those who take um, a more scripturalist approach use their understandings of texts to argue for a society with stronger public moral regulation and an enhanced role for religion in this state. Now what is new about this agency is not interpretation per se. Um, of course, religion is always interpreted and interpretation has, of course, been very central to Islamic traditions. Um, so what is new here is that through these organizations, women are involved interpre in interpretation in a way that is public um, and collective. Um, and I also distinguish between two modes of interpretive agency. Um, the first being deliberative, meaning that women are actually involved um, in discussions about the meaning of, of texts. Um, and the mobilizing mode, uh, meaning that they use an interpretation of a text to make public claims. So first, let me turn to Fatayat. Um, as I said, um, the wing of, of women's division of one of Indonesia's largest Muslim organizations, um, and it's for women between the ages of uh, 25 and 45. The leaders of Fatayat um, take a quite contextual and historicized approach to texts, emphasizing uh, what they call the substance of the religion, which, which they see as being equality and justice. Um, and this is certainly an approach that has grown out of Nadal uh, Tulama, um, which is in the Indonesian context generally labeled as traditionalist Islam. And in practice, um, this tends to mean that they emphasize the more interpretive aspects of texts, they draw on texts other than the Quran, and so on. And, and many of you know that this, of course, is a, a quite conventional approach, actually, to Islam, but has certainly been very influential in the Indonesian context um, and lends itself well um, to interpretation. Um, what's very important to keep in mind is that many of the members of Fatayat attended schools and universities um, that had some affiliation with Nadatul Ulama. And so this means that they were schooled in this particular um, Islamic discursive tradition. Um, now, ironically, actually, NU was actually, until fairly recently, quite conservative uh, when it came to gender, and in some quarters still is. Um, but as I said, this approach allows for multiple interpretations, um, and including those that use contextual or historical evidence. And so Fatayat and many other reformists in Indonesia have really capitalized on the flexibility of this approach 
um, and Fatayat in particular has combined it um, with a more uh, feminist approach. So Fatayat leaders now see the promotion of women's rights and empowerment as part of their mission as Muslims, and they're working to disseminate understandings of texts that emphasize gender equality. So what happens here is that women with a basic education in the NU approach to Islam then learn uh, more revisionist and more feminist um, interpretations once they join Fatayat. So Fatayat is really building on this NU tradition and then consciously applying it to gender and human rights. Um, and in this sense, the NU tradition endows them with authority in regards to interpretation and certainly with, with quite a bit of political legitimacy. So as I've said, Fatayat women then emphasize what they t see to be the substance of Islam and they emphasize the openness to interpretation and, and discussion. And so as, as one of the past leaders explained to me, she said, I think the most important thing is to implement the teachings of Islam in our everyday lives. And because life is dynamic, there is always room for in reinterpretation of texts. That way the values contained in the text will be applicable to all times and will always be meaningful. We won't be trapped in one particular interpretation, which in the end makes life difficult. So when it comes to polygamy, um, the leaders of Fatayat acknowledge that yes, the Quran does allow men to marry four wives. Um, and many of you will be familiar with the kinds of arguments that they're making against this. Um, they argue that the wording of the verse makes it clear that men can only marry one, more than one wife if they can support them all equally. And given that that would be very difficult in this day and age, that essentially it's, the answer is, is that it's not possible. Um, and they also maintain that these verses need to be understood in historical context. Um, so an example of, of how they argue against polygamy um, can be seen in, in one of Maria Ulfa's uh, newspaper articles in which she argues that the Prophet Muhammad's practice of polygamy was a special circumstance um, because during his lifetime there were a lot of widows around due to tribal conflicts. And she ends the article with this very strong statement that the basic principle of marriage in Islam is, is monogamy. Um, polygamy is an exception for urgent situations. Polygamy can be avoided if the couple understands that to achieve the goals of marriage, it is necessary to work together and have an equal pattern of relations between husband and wife. And obviously this is very strongly influenced by the writings of, of various Middle Eastern feminists and, and other reformist Muslims. Um, and along those lines, leaders of Fatayat argue that um, over the centuries, patriarchal interpretations have been institutionalized and, and that that needs to be changed. Um, so as another Fatayat activist told me, she said, when I study religion more deeply, I salute Islam even more. Um, because in the times of the Prophet Muhammad, Islam gave women a high position. But because in Indonesia, the culture is patriarchal and the ulamas are men, the verses are interpreted only as they look and they benefit only men. So my task is to straighten out those wrong interpretations. So the agency of Fatayat women is both deliberative and mobilizing. That is within the organization, they are involved in discussing and debating the meanings of texts, but they also use their interpretations to mobilize women for social change, as we see with these public claims about polygamy. Um, when they present seminars and workshops for their members, they very frequently refer to Islamic texts and practices. Um, and this is certainly an effort to convince members that the, that the changes they seek are acceptable within the framework of Islam, but it also comes out of their very sincere belief that Islam supports these kinds of changes. So the interpretive agency of Fatayat women is shaped by the structural changes I mentioned, democratization, middle class expansion, Islamic revival. But their social location is very important here. They're deriving authority for interpretation from their NU schooling and backgrounds, which is providing, giving them training in a particular approach um, and also gives them a lot of comfort in, in discussing texts and meanings. And that means that their agency is certainly partly constituted from within a particular Islamic discursive tradition. Um, and this contextual approach takes that tradition in new directions and then helps to sustain their concern for empowering women. Oops. 
I always skipped ahead here. Okay. So the Prosperous Justice Party, PKS, is one of Indonesia's most successful new political parties, and its founders were originally inspired by um, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, who, whose ideas certainly have been influential in Indonesia. And they advocate for making Islam the source of national policy and legislations. Um, in the most recent 2009 elections, they received close to 8% of the national vote. Um, the PKS members I met tended to foreclose the possibility of interpretation, arguing that the text of the Quran must be followed as it's written. Um, and this is, is what I call a scripturalist approach. It's an approach that really attempts to take the Quran at face value, but it does allow for flexibility in some matters. Um, most veteran PKS members were part of Muslim study groups on university campuses. And, then we're, and in these groups, they learned this approach to Islam that emphasized correct practice rather than interpretation, um, and where they were also taught that Islam is a complete and perfect system. And most of the women that I met from the party were recruited into the party through the network of these campus organizations. And this is an approach that also, of course, draws um, heavily on Islamic modernism, um, which itself has, has certainly been influential in Indonesia since the early 20th century. So the women in PKS argue that gender difference is natural and that it must be honored because the Quran specifies different but compatible roles for men and women. They argue that women's priority should be the domestic sphere, um, but unlike more extreme groups, um, they say that women may work outside the house if their husband permits them. And increasingly, they encourage women to be politically active as part of their mission to reform Indonesian society. Now, the party leadership maintains that polygamy um, must be legal because it's in the Quran. Um, and certainly some PKS leaders are known to have multiple wives, um, though none of the women that I met in the party were in polygamous relationships. Um, the women I met actually held rather diverse opinions on the practice of polygamy, um, but they argued vociferously against what they saw as increasing attempts to ban or regulate it. Um, so, for example, the, the sentiments of, of this one woman were, were very widely shared. She said, Islam, I think, represents rules from Allah. This is what we call Sharia. Allah knows the weaknesses of humanity and makes rules for this. For humans for whom one wife is not enough, Islam opens the opportunity for a polygamy. If a man really wants to have children, but his wife has been told that it is not possible, Islam permits polygamy. Also for a man who has high sexual needs, Islam permits polygamy. Because it is not possible for a woman to serve the man all day long, so a man may take another wife. In practice, we have to pay attention to the context of the polygamy. If it's only to satisfy desire, it's in contradiction to Islam. Now this statement is, I think, a little bit more nuanced than we might think at first. Um, She's here trying to emphasize what she sees as a difference between desire and need, although in practice, of course, how we would figure out that, that difference is kind of vague. Um, but according to her, it's okay if it's just for, if it's needed. It's not okay if it's just for desire. Um, and actually, a, a many women kind of echoed this point. Um, and others are acknowledged to me that they personally were uncomfortable with the idea of polygamy, but that they felt that as Muslims, they had to accept it. So their statements, I think, are very much predicated on a scripturalist approach to texts, which is central to the party. Um, so for example, another uh, woman told me that she thinks Muslims simply cannot be selective when it comes to the Quran. She said, the problem is we can only place our trust in Allah. Certainly for a husband who wants to do it, there must be many considerations. And she continued, individually as a Muslim, I accept it. This is because I want my Islam to be full, comprehensive, and not choosing just what is nice and leaving behind what is not so great. I want to be like that. So essentially saying, if you want to be a Muslim, you have to accept the entire package. You can't, can't pick and choose. So PKS women's interpretations um, were not especially deliberative. At least from what I saw, they rarely spent time discussing different possible interpretations. And indeed, often they, they sort of would argue that there weren't different possible interpretations. Um, now, I do think partly this is because most, um, compared to Fatayat women, most of the PKS women had little specialized training 
in Islamic interpretation and jurisprudence, um, although some were taking classes in Arabic. However, what they are doing is, is certainly very much in the mobilizing mode. That is, they are using the party's interpretations to make public claims, such as these arguments against regulating polygamy. So PKS Women's Agency is also shaped by the same structural changes that have helped to produce this, this broad cohort of educated activist Muslim women. But their particular way of relating to Islam reflects their positioning in relation to a somewhat different Islamic discursive tradition, one that combines transnational flows of Islam with the heritage of Islamic modernism and which uh, emphasizes this scripturalist approach. So Fatayat and PKS should be seen as incubators of women's political thought and activism. And activists are, are learning distinctive interpretive approaches in both of these groups. And Fatayat women's opposition to polygamy is buttressed by their contextual approach, which is flexible, um, and which emphasizes that understandings of text can be brought into line with contemporary realities. Um, so as we can see with this approach then, Fatayat women are building on a particular heritage of Indonesian Islam, yet it is historically new for women to be so involved in debating and making public use of Islamic interpretations. And what is also new is that some of them are using these interpretations to challenge what they consider to be patriarchal practices. In contrast, PKS women's defense of polygamy draws on this scripturalist approach um, that uses both transnational discourses and also builds on the Islamic modernist heritage. And they use this approach to argue for a society with stronger public moral regulation. In fact, I think this scripturalist approach lends itself to use by women because it actually doesn't require nearly as much education in Islamic jurisprudential traditions. But as with Fatayat, it is still new for women to be disseminating interpretations of Islam for their own political purposes, um, though in this case that purpose is, is generally not gender equality. But the, straight for, the scripturalist approach um, also does not allow for nearly as much flexibility. And consequently, I think what you can see from some of those quotes is that PKS women are sometimes somewhat hemmed in by their own conservative interpretations. Um, nevertheless, they do experience a strong sense of personal and collective empowerment through their activism. Now, it should be noted that Fatayat women claim to be involved in interpretation. This is something they, they talk about quite a bit. PKS women do not. In fact, they would say you know, what they're doing is not interpretive at all. Um, but I would argue that they are engaged in such work, and certainly scripturalism is one type of interpretive approach. Um, but they, what they are doing is in a mobilizing rather than deliberative mode. So I think examining Muslim women's activism in Indonesia provides an interesting perspective on questions of gender, religion, and agency. And a recent trend in scholarship has emphasized that pious women achieve fulfillment or satisfaction through submission to pious norms. And this perspective is certainly important in recognizing how agency is constituted from within social structures. But I think that studying activists perhaps gives us a somewhat different picture of agency. Um, the agency of interpretation, I would argue, turns on women's rather creative and sometimes critical engagements with religious discourses. Um, these activists are selecting from different possible interpretations deciding which texts to take up and which to ignore, and using interpretations to make public claims. And their interpretive approaches are learned through the organizations they are part of, which are building on different strands of Islam, both global and local. However, interpretive agency is not necessarily limited to the activists in these organizations. Um, Fatayat leaders teach their interpretive approach to their volunteer members all across the Indonesian archipelago. And similarly, new PKS cadres are, are frequently are instructed in the PKS approach to Islam. Um, so these approaches then are being much more widely spread through as these organizations mobilize women across the country. So the agency of interpretation facilitates the participation of pious women in public life and in religion itself. 
Uh, it has also certainly desecularized the Indonesian women's movement more broadly. And this absolutely constitutes change, um, but I think it's also important to remember that greater inclusion and visibility for women are not the same thing as equality. The agency of interpretation can be used in many different ways, and it is not necessarily feminist. Nevertheless, the agency of interpretation does give women in Indonesia and beyond um, the opportunity to draw selectively on religious traditions, to engage with global discourses, and to make claims on the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, since we are running out of time now, we have left 15 minutes for discussion. Um, so who wants to be the first to make a comment or to pose a question? I just uh, to the question to uh, Rachel regarding the Fatayat. Because I traced back to my study within one group, the, uh, I studied two groups as well. And uh, within one group there are multiple ideas regarding interpretation. They also select some parts of interpretation and, and ignore some. And some of them still against the interpretation of the sheikh, uh, uh, of the ulama in the group. So I wonder whether within Fatayat there are any uh, people who are against or quiet against or uh, try to uh, reinterpret or come o uh, to go beyond the mainstream interpre interpretation of the group. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there is certainly um, a range of views within both organizations, which, which I didn't have much time to, to talk about. Um, I think in Fataya, there is a, a general sort of agreement, I think, um, you know, on the kind of multiple interpreta interpretive possibilities of, of Islam. Um, but certainly, yes, some people take it further than others. Um, and there's also a range of political positions. Um, you know, some people are s s somewhat more conservative, others are, are much more, more liberal. Um, but I think the general tone of the organization has certainly, at least in recent years, has certainly been to, to push for um, more of these sort of alternative or, or revisionist interpretations, um, and certainly with um, a strong egalitarian spin to them. Uh, I just have two quick questions. One's, uh, the first one's for Michael um, Pilots about, uh, I thought these, the list of offenses that one can be tried for in the Islamic courts was really surprising and kind of shocking for me, but I didn't realize uh, the extent of the kinds of crimes uh, that existed in Malaysia. Um, but one question I had was in Pakistan, oftentimes with uh, cases of blasphemy, People use blasphemy charges, uh, the charge of blasphemy, as a way of getting back at somebody for a variety of other reasons. It's oftentimes uh, has very little to do with any kind of religious um, transgression, or it could be an issue of you know property dispute or whatever. So I was wondering if, in your um, research, you found that these kinds of charges are brought often a cover for other types of disputes or um, power dynamics going on between people. And the other question is for Rachel. Um, right at the end, you mentioned uh, desecularization of the women's movement, and I kind of, uh, my, my kind of perked up at that point. Uh, and I was just wondering if, you know, has there been a desecularization of the larger women's movement in Indonesia, and do these women's uh, groups kind of represent that kind of shift that's going on? And if so, why do you think that's happening? And when did it start? <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll just quick. Um, yeah, thanks. The, uh, the short answer is yes, the um, different kinds of uh, charges are brought against political enemies on a fairly regular basis. I mean, the, the best example is the former deputy prime minister and current opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim who was you know, stripped of his uh, deputy prime ministership and all of his official titles and thrown in jail in November, uh, what, uh, fall of 1998 on charges of sodomy, actually, um, and then recharged again. Anyway, he spent six years in jail, long story. But um, uh, that was actually under British law, Section 377, right, which is the same in Pakistan, India, formerly Burma, Singapore, not surprising. Um, so yeah, but he not charged under uh, the settlement provisions under the Islamic law, which are much more difficult to um, 
uh, try and adjudicate because of issues of witnesses and such. So the, the last thing I'll just say, the Islamic courts are much less susceptible to corruption, actually, than the uh, common law courts, partly because there's not usually a heck of a lot at stake money-wise. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. We can talk later. But. Uh, yes, so the Indonesian women's rights movement um, was generally, I think, as in many countries, I think for a, for a long time there was sort of a sharp division between the women's rights movement and Muslim women's groups, and they were sort of seen as, as kind of very different sorts of entities. And the women's rights movement, kind of such as it was in the, in the 80s and, and early 90s when it was somewhat repressed by the state, um, tended to be fairly secular in, it, in its outlook, although probably not as adamantly so as, as in uh, South Asia. Um, but what really happened in, in the 90s was that as the, the democracy and reformasi movement um, gained strength, a lot of different kinds of groups came together. And so a lot of Muslim youth groups, um, women's groups, environmental activists, all of these different activists, and there was a great deal of cross-fertilization um, between all of these kinds of groups. And so there were just a lot of sort of new ideas. And so, you know, women's rights activists who hadn't thought much about religion started thinking about it more carefully. Muslim groups started being interested in gender and, and so on. So there was just a lot of intermixing, I think, that came out of that um, democracy movement in the 90s. Um, and now, um, as Indonesia has democratized, I think Islam has taken on a, a much greater role in the, in the public sphere. And, and this is something that, that was building in, in the early 90s, but has, has grown stronger over the past uh, 20 years or so. And now I think um, what's interesting to me is that I feel in the, in the women's movement, the boundary between religious and, and secular is a very fuzzy one. It's not really a useful uh, binary to think with anymore in, in terms of activism in Indonesia, because uh, you know I find often people the same people are involved in secular organizations one year and then they're involved in a Muslim organization two years later. Um, and so th there's really actually um, a striking amount of, of overlap. Um, and for me, I do um, include a group that's more secular in, in my study. Um, and really the, the main difference um, between them is it's, it's a rhetorical difference. It's a matter of you know, how are you framing your arguments. Are you framing them with respect to sort of Sida and you know, human rights laws or with respect to Islam? And, and in practice, <coughs> most activists do both, I find. Yeah. yeah, hello. This question goes to Mr. Pellets as well. Um, since I'm a lawyer, I was especially interested in your talk. And I was wondering um, what you called the creeping criminalization, um, how well it is accepted in Malaysia and how well it is enforced even within the population, saying that um, are people denouncing each other for things like illicit um, proximity, or is it only, say, the police, which is looking out for illicit proximity and then uh, goes ahead? And um, yeah, how is the notion of these um, Islamic courts? Are there like the, the guardians of, of um, the real Islam, or are they just, um, well, a bad, um, what shall I say, a bad um, evolution of things. So, oh no, we still we have Islamic courts which are, you know, very bad for us as, as a population because we cannot behave as we want to. Um, this, the short answer, uh, thanks for the question, is that um, it's actually against the law to discuss many of these issues publicly. Um, so, for example, the Prime Minister declared a couple of years back, well, uh, shortly after 9-11 uh, actually, that Malaysia was an Islamic state. And uh, that was a surprise to m almost everybody in the country, well, many people in the country, certainly many Malaysia observers. Um, basically, to discuss that openly, publicly, is a criminal offense. So it's not something that invites a lot of public discussion. Uh, unless it's a relatively confined uh, academic conference, potentially okay, but not necessarily. Uh, but yes, so uh, to challenge the prerogatives of rulers, to challenge Islam as the official religion of the federation, to challenge the uh, 
supremacy of Malays vis-a-vis -vis Chinese and Indians. That's basically get you thrown in jail, not under religious law, but under secular, basically British provisions. So it's not something you really want to discuss too openly. But that said, the vast majority of people feel, as far as I could tell, and based on surveys and such, that um, as Muslim, I mean, like as in Rachel's talk, as Muslims, uh, people in Malaysia feel as Muslims, we are uh, required to adhere to Islamic law. And people have a f sense that whatever goes on in the Islamic courts is literally in the Quran. Now, most people have not been in the Zama courts, just, you know, except for the people who go there for marriage, divorce, or stray anthropologists or whatnot. But in fact, very little of that is, there's no, there's no mention of it. It's all British, it's all British procedure, and Japanese auditing, it's, it's not in the Quran. Anyway, complicated issues Oops, to, to, to be discussing publicly. Uh, I have a question to Sylvia Fatouk. Um, I wonder, you um, mainly concentrated on in customs of inheritance, and you didn't mention dowries, and I suppose that they are closely linked to inheritance as well. Could you comment on that? And I suppose that women are entitled to a dowry uh, when they get married. Is it a substantial sum they do receive? Do they have any rights on it, or are they supposed to add it to the property of their husbands? And I mean, it might be that uh, women do regard these dowries as their share of inheritance. Yeah, the issue of dowry is one that I had to leave out because I didn't have enough time. But you're absolutely right. Well, first of all, I should say that uh, in Islam, there's n no such thing as dowry in the form that it takes in India, um, but Muslims actually do follow this originally Hindu custom of giving uh, d large dowries or giving dowries of some size at, at least when the girl marries, the parents, you know, give to the th some things to the bride, but also some things go to the uh, groom and to the in-laws. So. A the jewelry that the parents give is part of the dowry that is supposed to stay with the, with the bride herself, even after marriage. But very often, the mother-in-law takes it and says, you know, I'll, t I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> so she doesn't always really have uh, control over it. But anyway, in theory, she does. Um, and of course, you're absolutely right. The argument that since she gets the dowry, she doesn't have a... Uh, any longer a claim on the uh, inheritance <coughs> is definitely the, a one of the rationalizations that's very, very often used. Um, although, I mean, depending on the wealth of the family, obviously, usually the dowry amount that's spent on the dowry and on the wedding feast and all that does not equate to what her share would be. But, you know, again, that, that varies. Um, there isn't any clear equivalence in terms of uh, value of those two things, but it is definitely used as a rationale for why they shouldn't also get a share of the inheritance. Um, and women accept this as, as much as men do. Uh, it's sometimes the point is argued, but of course that is. Uh, the other thing that they get is the mahar from the husband's side. Now that also in theory is supposed to be property that the bride, uh, it's usually money or sometimes gold, uh, that the bride, you know, in law has a right to keep. But it's very rarely paid, you know. In, f in fact, it's hardly ever paid. And even on divorce, it's usually not paid because there's no way of enforcing it and the widow who's supposed to get it if it hasn't been paid is always persuaded to waive her right to it that her husband will be, you know, suffer in the afterworld if, mm. if he, uh, you know, is made to think that he still owes it to her and so on. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you very much again for the three speakers and uh, we have the lunch break now.